Hello, 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 and thank you for checking out the Latrell Show, building businesses, bars, and brands. Now, on this show, I like to feature bartenders who have either built a business or a brand or have generally come up into something that's a little bit different. But in the days of COVID, I wanted to pivot and switch directions a little bit, which is something we should all be thinking about. And I saw a lot of chatter and a lot of criticism, especially around the USBG. Being the former New York chapter president, I had access to actually ask direct questions and I have a podcast. So I figured, why not give it a shot? Why not reach out to the executive director of the USBG so we can hear straight from the director's mouth exactly what is going on with the USBG uh, without any further the delay, please welcome the executive director of the USBG, Aaron Gregory Smith. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Uh, I know it's yeah, it's my pleasure. Super hectic, and uh, you know, I, I really just wanted to hear from you about what's going on because there's there's a lot of you know there's a lot of shit that people don't really understand about the USBG, and I just kind of wanted to create an opportunity to you know hear it straight from you. Yeah, that's my pleasure. I you know. I know a lot and I know a lot about the history. I don't know everything, but you know, I'm happy to share what I do know. I'm assuming that there are no days off. Uh, so what did you, what, what was, what was on your plate today? I took Easter off. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got Easter off. So today, let's see, what was today like? Um, today has been the least challenging day since March 15th. I would say. What happened March um, 15th? That was the day that the uh, the Jameson donation was announced. That was right. Saturday, March 15th. And then everything, uh, ev- you know, things kind of cascaded from there because really on that first day, I guess that was the 14th, but on the 15th is when our application link um, went viral. The Bartender Emergency Assistance Program application link went viral. Did Jameson reach out to you before they said, here's a million dollars? They, well, 500,000. And I'm, I'm um, so sorry, 500,000. Yeah, they contacted us on March 14th, on Saturday. And I think they sort of noticed right before leading into St. Patrick's Day um, that a number of municipalities were starting to restrict on premise activity. Not very many. But Jameson saw that as, a, you know, as no matter how many people it is, some people are going to be pretty seriously affected by this. So we'd like to we'd like to be able to help. So they contacted us on the 14th and we got wheels in motion to make sure that we were set up with a specific campaign. You know, we've done disaster relief through the bartender emergency assistance program before. So, you know, we kind of have our processes in place to create a, a restricted fund based on a specific occurrence. You know, we've done wildfire aid and hurricane aid and things of that nature before. Most so, recently in Nashville. Yeah, most recently in Nashville. And that one was somewhat that one was, was somewhat unique for a number of reasons, but I would say the best examples of what we've done in the past are California wildfires and and probably Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Maria and Irma, where a a supplier or a donor has contacted us specifically and said, we'd like to make aid available for this catastrophe or this emergency. So we had those in place. And when Jameson contacted us, the idea, you know, initially they were, we were going to announce it on, on Monday the 16th, but I think everybody got as time went on throughout the day and, and they wanted to get out ahead of it. And we said, okay, no problem. Go for it. And, uh, and then by Sunday morning, we, you know, their, their announcement didn't even include a link to our website. So that was all done by excited and nervous people who got notices on Sunday the 15th from their employers that um, as governors and mayors started closing down you know, bars and restaurants on the that 15th. Seems, that, that seems like so long ago. I mean, it was only a month ago. We're recording this on the, what, the 22nd today? I don't know, all, all yeah. the days. The, the, all the yeah. days kind of together. Um, so it seems like, uh, it seems like Jameson actually was kind of ahead of it and actually sparked a lot of philanthropy in the other organizations. They uh, certainly did. And I mean, when did you realize that this was such a watershed globe altering situation that was, that required so much care and so it required so much attention? Cause I, I feel like it caught all of us by surprise. Well, you know, our regional conferences were kicking off at the end of March, so we were watching it pretty closely. We had already had a number of meetings with chapter leaders across the country, especially our host chapters for our regional conference program. 
The U- and I'm, now I'm speaking about the USBG side. I'll, I'll try to be careful about when I say we specifying whether it's the guild or the foundation that I'm speaking on behalf of. On the guild side, we have regional conferences, which is a big program. And those kick off generally in March. So we were already talking, discussing, coming up with contingency plans a, few, a couple of weeks before this. But we did not know exactly how big the scale was going to be really until until March 15th, I think when everybody else did. Mm-hmm. It seems like uh, even the national conventions weren't quite aware of this yet, like Nat Club Mambara hadn't canceled yet, right. at, at least in my recollection, my recollection, Tales of the Cocktail no. just canceled. The things that canceled, um, South by Southwest had canceled the weekend prior. And I, kn- I only know that because I happened to be in Austin for a wedding on on March 7th. And when South by Southwest canceled, we got the, you know, I got the notification. Uh, so, you know, some big things had started to cancel, but they generally were really, were very large, like mass gatherings had started canceling mm-hmm. with that, that typically included international travel or, you know, pretty, pretty diverse geographic audiences is what we had seen at that point. And I, I remember looking all this up because I had a briefing about it on on uh, Friday the 13th. We, I, we had a briefing with some of our volunteer leadership and New Rochelle, New York, Santa Clara, California, and Seattle were the only were the only cities at that point that had done very strict closures of any kind. Mm-hmm. So what, yeah, what Francisco is, had, had put out guidance on on the 14th, I, and I know that because I live there. On the on Friday the 13th, San Francisco put out guidance to that they would be limiting capacity at some point to half of fire code, right? I, and I know that from home. I didn't do a survey, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I just do that from local. It's it's tough to keep all these dates and times and, and yeah, yeah. destination points uh, straight because every day is every day is just like a whole new thing. What What is the relationship between BEAP and the USBG? Are they uh, under the same umbrella? Are they mutually exclusive? Yeah, I think that's a... You know, we the separation really dates back to the founding of, of the USBG National Charity Foundation in 2012. And that was when uh, a committee of the USBG, which was inv- which wanted to be involved in community in, in promoting community service and charity work was formed. And we around that same time, uh, you may remember, you know, big groups of bartenders and especially in chapters would band together and raise a lot of money to help in certain scenarios and, you know, either pass a hat or pull off an event and do something um, to raise aid. You know, one that you were involved in the Hurricane Sandy efforts. And I was involved on the local level at the time in raising funds. I think um, San Francisco chapter held an event and raised, you know, something in the order of like 17,000, if I recall correctly, it might've been 27. I know there was a seven in it. Um, And Sandy Sandy was such a wild time. Uh, Yeah. And, and all these, all these efforts were great. They were not, but they, as, as our, what we were learning is that our trade association was not our, you know, our C6 was not authorized to raise funds on behalf of charitable efforts, right? Because it's not a charity, it's a nonprofit but it's not a charity. So Mm -hmm. that work that we were doing was good for good reasons, all the right, all the right reasons, but it wasn't regulated in terms of disaster relief or poverty relief, which was kind of the work that people wanted to do. So we would see fundraisers for an individual in the community. um, And people would want to help. Of course, like our community wants to get out there and help people and take action. They want to take action before they even know where they're going. A lot of times, right? Action first, ask questions later, which is something that I, I find so inspiring about our group is that if something needs to be done, we're going to go and do it before we even know exactly what it is. We're going to throw our hands in there and get, and get them, get our, our hands dirty and get it done. Mm-hmm. And so the, the foundation was, was formed to give those efforts legitimacy that they could go on the record that we could accept large scale contributions from multinational corporations, dot all the I's and cross all the T's when we wanted to do that work. So it started slowly and, Honestly, the U.S. The, the guild, the association side, was only stronger for it. Like the association had to get more dialed in and buttoned up as we started doing 
the charitable work, the the charity work for the foundation, because uh, 501c3s are much are have a much higher level of visibility and a higher level of regulation, and so as we were defining the relationship between the guild and the foundation, we really had to get the guild stronger and more responsible, more, uh, I would say, you know, just more buttoned up. Um, and the foundation helped the guild in that way, right? Because it had to define itself so that the foundation could be itself, right? Could be what it needed to be. And so the, uh, in, I, I, you know, I don't recall if, if you were at, I know you were at a couple of our leadership conferences early on. I don't recall if you were in Austin in 2013, but, but that was about the time that the foundation was applying for its nonprofit status. The C6, and, yeah. Yeah. So the, the guild right around that same time really created its first official board of directors in 2013. And a lot of you're, those. Which yeah, you're not ahead of. Um, I actually work for the board of directors. Okay. Yeah. So you're the, you're the executive director of the USBG and yeah. you, uh, you work. And then the board of directors is volunteers. The board of directors is volunteers. They're elected by members and they are my boss. So they do my performance evaluation. They hire me. They're the ones that would be, you know, are responsible for any sort of disciplinary action. Um, yeah. So they're my boss. And then I am the boss of the staff. So I'm sort of like the executive director is sort of the chief of staff for an association. Some now some associations, and I've I've learned more about this over time. Some associations have their their CEO is also the president of their board, and then they have a board chair because of sort of our organization has resolved to have the president be a volunteer. Yeah, I, it seems like a kind of an interesting situation, uh, and I'm sure that that's very complex. Uh, as you know, mm. um, once you get attention, especially as a not-for-profit or as a trade organization, uh, the flow the flow of criticism is like swift and abundant, typically, yeah. uh, and no yeah. good deed goes unpunished. Um, so I'm, I'm just cu- yeah. So I'm just curious. Like I mean, it's it seems like a very difficult job. And um, you know, I knew you back when you were when you owned 15 Romolo, and yeah. uh, even before that, I think a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, those were those seemed like much simpler days. Uh, <laughs> certainly, certainly. <laughs> yeah, you. We met when I was a volunteer uh, for the organization, and. At the time, I think I think we probably met around 2010 or 2011. At the time, the organization, the USBG, the foundation was a glimmer in somebody's brain, not mine. Um, the USBG itself had, you know, maybe under 15 chapters, definitely under a thousand members at this time. Where is it and at now? And we had, uh, we're, you know, membership. We we don't have annual membership. Well, dues are paid annually. We don't have like a, 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 a date. So numbers fluctuate, but we are generally anywhere between 4,500 and, and 5,000 at any given point. And how many chapters? Uh, that's, that was sort of our average. Um, well, we're organized. We now have two different levels of community representation. One is a chapter, which is a fully formed corporation that has an affiliation agreement with the, the guild. And then others are, for all intents and purposes, they are small, they're just affiliated communities. But in, in that capacity, at some level of organization, we're represented in 70 communities nationwide. That's, that's a lot. That's a big deal. And so they're, yeah. uh, so they're, so they're all independent and then they have, then they agree. The chapters to sign, are, yeah. The chapters are. And so are they their, their own LLCs, their own 501c3, C6s? They're, they're corporations. Corporations. So they are, they are corporations and they're, they are, they're, they're, you know, in, in the IRS parlance, subordinate corporations, subordinate entities, you know, they, they are formed uh, within the USBG's group exemption status. Um, so uh, what is the primary directive of the USBG? Uh, I mean, and, and, and has that changed in the age of COVID-19? The, so the guild, um, the guild, again, as, a, as the guild and the foundation were, were forming sort of in a parallel path, right? The guild has existed since 1948, but as it defined itself a little bit better, uh, it really focused in on 
professional development for hospitality uh, for hospitality folks, specifically as it relates to bartending and um, you know beverage alcohol service. The, and the foundation was was created to focus in on those more personal development needs, like the physical health and wellness, emotional. Um, financial things, mental things of that nature. So, the guild is sort of our professional, uh, our professional group, and where we think about our 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 community as individual people and what unique needs and support they they have. That's kind of what we wanted to organize into the foundation side. So, the primary directive of the guild is, you know, our, and it is summed up in its mission. It's uniting the hospitality community to advance professional bartending. And while the hospitality community may be shrinking over the next however many months, that work still needs to be done because restaurants and bars are still going to be under-resourced for professional development. Uh, that is why the USBG needs to be there in the first place, because it's a, low, it's a high labor, low cost industry, or sorry, high labor, low margin industry. And it is very challenging without significant, you know, um, efficiencies of scale to provide any level of professional development consistently in a small or medium-sized restaurant group. Even, even the large corporations that are engaged here know the, the, the cost turnover ratio doesn't make sense to, to invest a ton in professional development for bartenders. As the USBG, I think we firmly disagree that it's not worth anybody's time or effort. Mm -hmm. which is why we then can't get it at work. I don't think that that need changes, um, even if the scale and scope of it changes a little bit. I've seen various conversations, uh, and I had to make this correction many, many times when I was the president in New York, that uh, we are not a union, uh, that we, that we right. were built. And, um, and I've seen a lot of conversations happening, especially recently about trying to unite, you know, the bartenders, service and hospitality workers as a labor block, as a voting. Mm -hmm. block. Um, does, uh, I mean, what do you think about that? What do you think about the, um, the, the potential, uh, the, the thought of unionizing uh, service and hospitality workers nationally? Well, I would say that the, the guild itself doesn't have a current position on that. So I'll have to speak for myself. Uh, and I can also preface what I'll say for myself to, to mention that there was a time. So one of the reasons that people get confused is because there are a number of, of unions with the name guild in their title. The screen actors guild is a good example. That is a union. It's a union for screen actors. And the reason that the name is there is because the guild predates unions. Frankly, um, the guild was there as a trade representative before it unionized. And when it unionized, it kept its name. Hmm. This happened to a lot of the guilds in the 60s and 70s. At least this is what I'm told from our historians of the USBG. Mm -hmm. And the USBG is no, no different. There was actually a period of time that the United States Bartenders Guild was renamed the U.S. Bartenders Association because the guilds were unionizing and our members did not want to be a union. Now, at the time, this I think it, at this period in time, the guild may have been represented in in three cities at most, maybe four at that point. Um, so, but I, so you know, I digress. But I will say, our organization in its history at some point did consider unionizing and didn't. Um, I would say that I think people people who want to unionize absolutely should do so. I, from what I understand, unions are affiliated, um, can be affiliated nationally, uh, but are typically organized a little bit more locally. I think most of them even say local something or other in their name. I, I, um, I think it's so, a similar structure of like subordinate corporations. Like Yeah, same, similar thing. Um, would the USBG unionize? I find that there are a number of members who are excited about the idea of collective bargaining. And then there are also a number of people who go move into the hospitality community because, or into hospitality jobs because they're very entrepreneurially spirited. Um, and they like the freedom and flexibility of being in the hospitality world because it allows them to do a lot of other things. I think the guild could be a place where we do, where both of those groups of people can get something. 
Um, and I think a union does not offer a lot to the entrepreneurial type person. Yeah, I, I don't really fully understand exactly what the what the the movement is about, but it seems like we're. I don't think that we're anywhere near getting uh, sharing the same voice on a national level. But I, I agree with you. You know, if you if you're into it, bless your heart. Chances are you might be working at a big hotel somewhere. Who is that? Is already right. nice. But yeah, and I I think union you know for the long term lifetime you know sort of career hospitality worker I think unions are incredible. Right. I know. I know a lot of people who will have much more successful long-term outcomes if they join a union property. Totally. Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of other people who where you know, with a lot of like personal ambition and, and again, entrepreneurial spirit, I, I say that a lot that are not going to be served by an employer that moves like a unionized house moves in my younger days. Uh, as a as a hospitality worker, I would not have enjoyed working in a union house. Yeah, um, I, I can't imagine it either. I mean, it's like we used to when I lived in California, and and today it's like if you want to pay twenty five bucks for a head of lettuce, then unionize all the farm workers for sure. Um, right. And, it, and it's I, I know that that's an oversimplification, and it's probably going to yeah. be perceived as insensitive. But the reality is, is that you know, yes, things can improve for for bartenders. And if you're into this, isn't a show about being like, about joining a union or whatever. But I just wanted yeah. to see if if, um, if it had crossed yeah. your desk. Absolutely, um, and I see so, other um, organizations so, starting to do that work, and I think it's I think it's valuable work, and and they should do it. So is the is the USBG involved in local, state, or federal politics? Does the USBG like uh, retain discus or anything like that? We don't retain discus. We partner. We have been working more closely with discus, and we we follow. I think our our sponsorship contracts opt into the discus marketing guidelines because we think that they are good good thoughtful guidelines for how to engage with you know a controlled substance in the marketplace. And so I see Discus as a good partner, a good, and, and I look forward to partnering with them more. We did work with them on a, an anti-tariff campaign recently, but that is the extent of our advocacy work at this point. And one of the reasons that I've been hesitant to engage in political advocacy is I, I think we need a little bit more time to work on our message discipline as a practice, as a regular practice, before we start getting involved in the higher stakes, what I can, I would consider higher stakes of political advocacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. It's a very slippery slope. Um, you know, you'd like, yeah. you don't want to, you don't want to like, uh, becoming, uh, being a trade guild, um, is not, not the same thing as being a political advocacy or, um, or representing or, or being a representative of one's political, religious, philosophical beliefs. Absolutely. Uh, and important. one, you know, even if we were to move into that work, we would likely do something similar to what we're doing with the foundation and form a separate organization to help create that, those, those guidelines and, and just boundaries on the work that the C6 is doing. Um, I think it has been extraordinarily helpful as our chapters have tr have wanted to get into charitable aid work during this crisis, this particular crisis, it has been helpful to explain and help them understand their exempt purpose is related to education and, you know, professional development, not poverty relief. So if they are going to do that work, they need to partner with an entity that knows how to do that work, you know, right, you know, charity and disaster relief is not a pop-up event. It's not, it's not a catering event. You know, it's not something that you just turn on and turn off. If you're going to create services to help a community in need, you need to be mindful of sustainability. You need to be mindful of creating, you know, um, of, of supporting a community for the long term. It's not something to turn on and turn off. So it has been helpful as we're messaging, as we're working with these incredibly, you know, incredible groups of, high initiative, very well connected community leaders, it's been helpful to say, that's not what you're organized to do, but we can help you find ways to do it. And, and that's one of the things that has been amazing is watching some of these communities 
actually form these relationships and with other local nonprofits to have our community serve better by an existing organization, one that already has the infrastructure. So we're not duplicating the efforts. We're not creating parallel delivery pathways that are just inefficient. I know you're an efficiency-minded person. So it, one of the things that I find most frustrating is, um, is when we think that we have to do everything ourselves because, because nobody has thought of us before or thought of us in this way. And really what we need to do is convince people who are very good at doing this work already to include us in their services. And, and, and if right now I think there's a great case for the hospitality community to receive a carve out from other charitable organizations. And that's what I'm seeing happen for these chapters with food banks or other food, local food agency nonprofits, uh, partnering with the chapter to get extra resources and extra hands, extra volunteers to, to provide a new service within an existing organization. I am loving that and seeing just how quickly you can get up and get scaled if you work with somebody who already knows what they're doing. Yeah. Um, I, I've noticed uh, as well that there are kind of basically two buckets of what people believe is a good direction for aid. Like there's like sustainability initiative where you're like doing like, mm -hmm. let's do skilling, let's do job training. Let's, uh, let's diversify. Let's, let's uh, make people's skills available to other industries and get outside of our bubble. And then there's what, um, then there's direct relief, which is like writing checks to people and people applying for money and, and receiving it. You know, it's, it's, it's impossible. It is impossible to find out, uh, to, to presume what is the correct path of action. And, um, the, right. um, the national charity foundation has clearly made a choice, uh, for direct relief, which I think is admirable. Um, it's certainly very difficult, um, because people, it like is. you said, you got 65,000 applications in one day. And that's from yeah. people who don't know. Uh, I, I talk a lot about horizons and what, what my horizon is. Like if I lost my job today, what is my horizon? And thankfully it's, couple weeks, months down the road. Um, if I had nothing coming in, but other people don't know where the next meal is coming from. And it's, um, right. you know, I was talking to Kim Hasselrud about this and, and she was telling me about how, um, it's a very difficult selection process, uh, to get through all these applications. And it's, we're to, at this point, I'm guessing it's in the hundreds of thousands. Um, yeah. I, I mean, how does that, how does that work? Your question was about how do we get through it all? And is this even the right, the best way to get help to people? No, no, no. I mean, I don't know. I know. I, no, I, I believe that I, I believe you made the right decision because that's, that made sense and it makes sense. And that, that getting people checks right now is totally valuable, but how did like, and it is life changing for the people that received it because there isn't, there is nothing else. Like we can't depend on the government to save us right now because like small businesses are applying for money and they're not getting it and they're not going to get it. I didn't, I applied, I'm not going to get anything. Right. Um, and, uh, I'm just, it just seems like, a. am just trying to be empathetic in, and how, how, and trying to illustrate how difficult that must have been. And that must be on a day-to-day -day basis to be like, we have, we're sitting on this pile of cash and I, I'm trying to put it in a, a nicer yeah. way, but it's, like, but you have an endowment now and, um, and then how do you disseminate that? And that must've been a difficult decision. Yeah. Well, we've received about half of what has been pledged. Um, so that's, you know, and, and, but we're, we're counting on what's being pledged. You know, we're, we're making our projections of, of on, based on how it's going to be pledged or what's been pledged. What we can do is, scale our process, which was the first thing that we started doing, right? As soon as we hit 10,000 applications, by the time I woke up on Sunday morning, um, we knew we were working in a completely different scale, right? Than we had traditionally worked. We were, we were already at more applications than we'd ever received in the lifetime of the program, right? So, Sunday, we started reallocating staff resources and getting a staff plan in place immediately, you know, immediately about who was going to be redirected off of other work and onto this work uh, starting Monday morning. 
And then we started looking for what our platform options were going to be, started working with software engineers to take the information that we were getting on what's intended to be a pretty manual hands-on process and systemize it. So that's what we started doing immediately. This was on March 15th, 16th. 15th, Yeah. 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 This is what we started doing. So after about the first week, we had a plan for how we were going to deal with the first crush of applications. Um, but then, and we had our, and we started working on transitioning to a more robust platform that would allow us to do a little bit more filtering and a little bit more uh, detail work on the applications on a large scale basis, right? Because normally what that, app, that application that has been online since 2016 is intended to be an intake form for what was an interview process to help a bartender prepare an application for aid that could be approved by our approval committee. Mm-hmm. And overnight, legitimately overnight, it received more attention and more participation and more response than in its entire lifetime. So I heard it was the, so I, what, I heard it was the number one form on Formstack. It was it was the number two form. The first form was a form on a public health department website to request a test. Huh. And I think that That's, one was like in New York or something. <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it. Um, yeah. So, so they, yeah, it was, it was the number two form on Forbes stack. And they, um, so they immediately got in touch with us and started helping us figure out a workflow to deal with that, um, which we've done as of today, everybody who applied in the first two weeks has been contacted and told, you know, their next steps. Um, you know, like I said, that form was set up for a one-on-one process. There, there were a lot of open fields because we, we consciously put open fields in that form so that people could tell us what they felt comfortable telling us so that we could call them and ask the more personal details on a mm-hmm. one-on-one basis because we felt really uncomfortable asking for a lot of personal details on just a blanket form on the internet, you know? So we, we intentionally left it somewhat vague and we did make about halfway through, we were able to make a couple of adjustments that captured better information. But, you know, there were a significant number of people in that first week that did not read the open field instructions and, and just submitted inaccurate or incomplete information in those fields. And we couldn't process them. So, you know, I, as you may have seen on social media, there were there was a day last week that people, a lot of people got some notifications from us and they were not happy about them. Um, a lot of them referred to them as being denial app like notifications, but they actually didn't say deny anywhere on them. And it just said that based on what you submitted, we couldn't determine your eligibility. If you think you're eligible, please reapply. And tens of thousands of people wrote something incomplete in their work history. It's basically what it is. Like they didn't put what their job title was, or they didn't put the the address of the restaurant. So there was no way for us to verify it. You know, the name of the restaurant didn't match the W2. These are all, these are all things that we couldn't do anything about. And we don't have enough people to call 55,000 people and help them adjust their application. So every single one of those people was asked to reapply if they thought they were eligible. Um, of course, that 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 was hard to read when you feel like you're you're already waiting. Yeah, yeah, no, I bet. And for some people, they haven't worked in over a month now. Um, right, uh, and they're were, yeah, they're were, scared. Yeah, everybody's scared. Uh, were were there condi- were there conditions on the money uh, from any particular donations? The only condition that we are managing right now is owners of a beverage alcohol license. Um, are not eligible for this. Can't so be. individuals only. Individuals only. Well, individuals may own a part of a liquor license and they are not eligible. Th- that doesn't have to be the case, but it isn't a bad idea under the circumstances when we're talking about the scale of these donations, because there's a lot of questions on a state by state level about what a supplier can give of value to a retail licensor, licensee. And yeah. that's hard to navigate on like on scale, right? And 
I think the point that I'm really trying to get across is that from a workflow and a process standpoint, um, mm-hmm. and that and and crossed by a um, compliance and efficiency, and it's impossible. It's impossible to to do this right with the time frame that you have, and um, yeah. And I've seen some of those things, and I've seen some of those things on social media, and people are upset. Would you say that you're doing the best you can? Oh, absolutely, Jason. I just did a calculate. So we we have. As of today, everybody who submitted their application in the first two weeks has gotten next step notifications. Yes, that's a month. It took volunteers over 9,600 hours to screen those applications, but they did it. What about using some of the money to hire people? That would probably take a workforce of 200. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, and that would defeat the purpose of actually receiving money in the first place because the idea is that it's to get people direct relief. Okay. I mean, that's, and the volunteers I, are working hard. So I think uh, I think they're doing a good job. Yeah. So what is, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the volunteers and like the structure of how they get their job done and, and how they were, shout them out. I mean, I, t- I talked to Kim, but who yeah. else is out there? Well, I'll, I, I feel very comfortable talking about the screening process because we're finished with the volunteer part of it. One thing to note is we are very discreet on our selection criteria and very discreet on our vetting processes because everything we publish makes us more susceptible to fraud. Every single detail. Now that that part of the process is closed and I feel very comfortable sharing, we had over 475 people trained in two weeks to go through the screening process. The screening process was blind, so the name and contact information fields have been blinded out. I can't guarantee that everything was blind because somebody may have put identifying information in an open field and I couldn't, Mm -hmm. you know, I can't tell you whether or not they did that. Every application that was screened by hand got, you know, the screener had to certify that they didn't, they likely didn't know the person. Um, And if, you know, that's a conflict of interest question. And every application has that recorded. And the applications that had, you know, uh, that a screener said, I may know this person went through a separate process. So that was hundreds, hundreds of the applications that were reviewed were rejected, you know, had to go through this parallel process to make sure that our volunteers weren't screening applications for people they knew. Yeah. Making um, decisions, yeah. 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 We want to eliminate as much bias and discrimination as possible. Right. Uh, that's a big, that's an important part of this. And, and the reason that we think about the publishing angle of this is because we have been, we, during a different disaster campaign, we did receive a, a number of fraudulent applications and we were able to verify them, you know, pretty quickly. We could see that it was happening because the activity was so unique. So we had to do a lot of research. Every organization that's getting disaster, that's engaging in disaster relief right now is being targeted for sure. So we have to have these protections in place. And that's why we're not, we're not publishing on the website step-by-step step what we are evaluating because that just gives somebody exactly the information they need to get through the process. So we've been as transparent as possible. And that's what we just keep telling everybody is read it and tell the truth. I actually saw so, somebody on Facebook that told uh, that advised everyone to put um, ten years plus on their work history because uh, they they heard that we were only advancing people that had ten years or more experience. That's not accurate. Um, but also, advising people to lie on an application and commit fraud is also inadvisable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Um, I, I had a question about. I mean, you're heavily reliant on volunteers um, because it is a not-for-profit organization. It's both a C6 and a C3. Um, And just just, um, the big difference from my understanding is that a C3 can issue tax-deductible receipts and a C6 Mm -hmm. is um, basically you can receive donations and it's not-for-profit, but but you can't issue tax-deductible donations, right? Or tax-deductible receipts, uh, among other things, I'm sure. (laughs) Um, Right. um, I mean, those are the big differences, yeah. Um, but, uh, working with a volunteer workforce, I remember having, uh, much, much smaller issues with this, um, you know, as far as like reliability and like, you know, are people, how committed are people and are they going to show up if I book them and, and rely on them to do something? I- I'm just curious what it's like to work with a almost exclusively, vol- how many people are on staff at, at the USBG, uh, 14. Salary? 
14 salaried staff 14. at USP. And then, uh, and then there's a volunteer workforce. What? Right. 14, I, I didn't realize that, that was, it was that many. I remember um, in the old days, it was like basically you and Sheila, right? <laughs> um, me, Sheila. What, when you were there, I think it was Paul. When, when I started in late 2013, I was the, there were three of us. And then um, Tiffany came on in early 2014 and a uh, little bit by a little bit over time. As we have gotten you know, more consistent programs and we're, you know, the regional conference program is a big one that just happens every year now. And, you know, uh, it needs employees to, to push it through, you know, so to, to make it happen and make it happen consistently. So yes, we are up to 14 staff on the, on the guild and that supports the foundation, right? The it's the foundation doesn't have a separate staff. Um, the foundation, you know, the, the foundation is supported by the guild staff. All right, man. Well, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Uh, I have a couple um, short questions. What is, well, this one's a tough one, but like, what do you see the role of a bartender <laughs> being in a post COVID United States? Well, I think we're already seeing a little bit of it, but bartenders are really what they do on a day-to-day -day basis is connect people. And that's what I'm seeing them do right now. Uh, even, even some of the folks who are frustrated with us are doing a really good job of connecting with other people who are frustrated with us and banding together to get answers to their questions. You know, like, <laughs> like connecting people is just sort of in the DNA. And, and I'm seeing that happen at the community level. I have always seen our community as super action oriented. And I think when it comes time to sort of reopen the doors, it's going to require a lot of very action oriented people to do that. Uh, so, I, I would say those two things. I think that the role of the bartender is to remain, uh, to do what they do already, which is be action oriented, to get the things done that need to be done and to connect people along the way. Well, thank you for that. I, I totally agree with you on that. What, so what do you think is the most helpful thing that, that, that we can do right now to support our own community? I mean, like you've seen all the actions of the other NGOs and, you know, and obviously nobody can work. A lot of people can't work. You know, what, what, what can we do? Uh, what, what do you recommend people do on a day-to-day -day basis that can help? I, I think short-term and near-term, short-term and, and, and near-term, I guess, would, is that I don't even know how to think about long-term right now, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, in the short-term, make sure people are eating. Do what you can to help people get food whether that's working with Meals on Wheels or food banking or just literally feeding your neighbor, whatever it is, like help people get food now. Don't stop doing anything that gets people food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, that's, no, it's, it's like, we, like, uh, I, I feel like we, like we talking again about horizons, like we haven't really fully embraced the fact that, uh, there is going to be a meaningful food shortage for people and, and, uh, the money shortage like begets a food shortage. Um, right. I, I so feeding totally people, good. I think is the, is, is the short term don't lose sight of it. And then the second thing I would say is you know, it kind of gets to, to what you were mentioning is who can pivot, you know, who can pivot into other types of service jobs, who can pivot, how can we get people the skills and the connections they need to, to do other work that can be done right now and encourage that to happen as much as possible. Oh my God. I've been banging um, that drum for a while. Those <laughs> are the two that's near term. So short term feed them second term, you know, pivot to employment that you can, and then be prepared to welcome everybody back as soon as we can get reopened. Yeah. I know. Okay. Well, um, thank you again so much for your time. I understand that, uh, when I ask you to do this, that, that I'm pulling you away from things that are directly helping people. <laughs> and, um, thank you so much for your honesty and your transparency. And uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. You got it. I hope we can talk again with more better news. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And face to face less than six. Yeah. And maybe face to face. <laughs> that might be helpful. <laughs> All right, Jason. Thanks so All much. Right. Thank you so much. As you may have noticed, there is a lot of complexity here. I was extremely hasty to judge the USBG on what I thought were transparency issues, uh, organizational challenges, but I didn't really have the context that I needed to see exactly what they were facing, what they were dealing with. So 
you know, they've since raised millions and millions of dollars. I don't know what the exact figure is, but that causes a lot of input in the form of applications for that money. And I think it's important to note here that they made a conscious decision to provide direct relief. It is yet to be determined exactly how that money is going to be allocated, but you know, I'm, I'm confident that uh, they're going to make the right decision and do what they think is best because, you know, they were not originally set up to be a, a relief organization. They were set up to be a trade guild. And I think that's something that a lot of people forget, myself included. So hopefully hearing directly from Aaron Gregory Smith will lend some clarity to your thinking and your um, support or understanding of, of the USBG in this time of crisis. I hope you enjoyed this episode speaking with Aaron Gregory Smith, the executive director of the United States Bartenders Guild. Please be sure to check out the show notes for a brief summary of the show and links to all the stuff that we talked about. A special thanks to Danny Messina for editing and post-producing this show. If you like this show, you may enjoy another project that started called The Industry Distilled with Duff and Latrell. We read the news so you don't have to. We go live on Thursdays on Facebook, or you can head to industrydistilled.com for updates. I want to keep these shows short and dense. If you have any thoughts, questions, or ideas, please reach out to me at Jason Luttrell on Twitter and Instagram, or search for Jason Luttrell on Facebook and LinkedIn. If you got anything out of our time together, you can thank me by simply sharing this with one other person. If you loved the show, please hit the subscribe button, leave a rating, review, or comment on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, iHeartRadio, or pretty much wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again for checking out The Latrell Show. Stay well, and we'll see you next week.